Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the final uh, fiscal year 2023 EHCC lecture series online presentation. I'm Carol Walker, and today have the privilege of hosting Hawaii Through the Lens of Fiction, a talk with two Hawaii-born and raised authors, Sarah Ackerman and Jasmine Iolani Hakes. And let me give you brief introductions to each of them, and I will tell you that I have cribbed some of the language directly from their websites, and I strongly suggest that uh, if you have not <coughs> their websites, that you that you do so. I'm going to paste them in that box now, so you should all be able to get them. Um, okay, there we go. Yes, so definitely check them out if you have not already. And I'll start by introducing Sarah. Sarah Ackerman, Ackerman is a USA Today bestselling author who writes books about love and life and all of their messy and beautiful imperfections. She believes that the world is in need of uplifting and heartwarming stories. Born and raised in Hawaii, she studied journalism and later earned graduate degrees in psychology and Chinese medicine. She blames Hawaii for her addiction to writing and sees no end to its untapped stories. Sarah is the author of six books, including Radar Girls, The Codebreaker Secret, and Red Sky Over Hawaii. Hawaii is a central element in all of her books, and her novels are historical and mostly feature World War II settings. And Hilo native Jasmine Iolani Hakes is author of the debut novel Hula, which is on Oprah's Book Club Spring Reading List and Elle Magazine's list of 39 best new books to read in summer 2023. Hula is not strictly historical fiction, but it is very informative about both the history of the Hawaiian kingdom and in a fictionalized setting, some of the issues <laughs> that local communities have dealt with more recently. Um, Hula was inspired in part by Jasmine's childhood experiences as a non-native local, as well as her experiences as a mother, raising one daughter who is native Hawaiian and one who isn't. Dance has always been central to Jasmine, who took her first Hula class at age four and partly put herself through college as a professional luau dancer. So I thought that we could start this event by asking each of our authors to read a short passage that is meaningful to them from their writing and ask them to tell us a little bit about why they chose it. So we will start with Sarah. And Sarah, you may go ahead. Recording in progress. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I chose from my book, Red Sky Over Hawaii, I, I was going to read from the Codebreaker's Secret, but because I'm at the volcano right now, I thought I would just read the very short prologue from Red Sky Over Hawaii. So here it goes, because this book is set here at the volcano. So here it goes. When I close my eyes, I still see the fiery glow of lava in Halemaumau Crater. Sometimes, if I'm not careful, I find myself walking through the clouds while the honey creepers build nests in my hair. I can't see where I'm going, but I don't care. To be there with my boots crunching on lava is sweeter than any honey from the hives. Bees swirl around me. I still feel my hand in his and the sound of his voice whispering in my tired ear. In the end, we remember those slices of time where we feel the most. Love, anguish, joy, sorrow, fright. I don't care what the reason. Maybe it was the day you first realized you were mortal or that first moment you saw love walk in the door, or that no matter how many years passed, you would still be that girl, the barefoot one with long brown hair and a penny in her pocket. Maybe it was when you suddenly everything to lose and you were too blind to focus. What matters most is what lives in your heart. And if there is one thing I know, it is this, love is the only way and magic. I guess that's two. That's my little intro to the book. That's very lovely. And it's very appropriate now, given that uh, uh, Holly Ma I what happened. I hope I didn't blow the speaker out. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, this book is 
of course, everyone always asks, which is your favorite book? Um, and it's hard, it's a really hard for me to answer because I love them all, but I think because I love the volcano so much, um, it's one of my favorite places in the world. Um, that, that's, it's special for me. That's why I chose that, that passage. <laughs> Did I, I, I'm sorry, everyone. Um, I am not an experienced Zoom host and I cannot seem to mute those of you who are not Sarah or Jasmine or me. So uh, could I ask that anyone who is unmuted, please mute yourself because we are getting some background noise. So um, Sarah, did I hear you say that you're in Volcano now? Yes, I am. My friend has a house here for, for a week and we're just enjoying it. I just got here today though. So I haven't, haven't gone down and seen the lava yet. But. Did you come specifically because of the uh, eruption or did you already have plans to come? Um, we were already gonna come actually. So the, okay. most of my friends are teachers. And so they all, summer break, they always plan something right after school ends. Okay. That's great. Well, I loved that passage that uh, sounded almost like a, a goddess speaking, you know, with the honey creepers building nests in the hair. <laughs> that was uh, that was quite lovely. And now, Jasmine, um, if you could read a little something to us. I will. I'm, I'm going to say, though, I'm very jealous, Sarah. My brother-in-law actually works at the Volcano House, so we, I get, I'm not there, but I get the play-by-plays whenever it gets dark and, you know, oh, yeah. all the lights are changing. It's kind of amazing. I wish I was oh. there. Awesome. Um, I chose a part that's kind of towards the end of the book. And um, one of the things that I would wanted to do, I'll just very briefly, is uh, tell a contemporary story set in Hawaii that included some of the challenges that, uh, that uh, we continue to kind of um, struggle with. But uh, the history I, it was hard to assume that people would understand what that context was without, you know, it, without just Hawaiian history being very well known. And so I weave that throughout the book. So um, one, it, this is presented as a, a mini hula, the apology hula, whereas we lived in an organized Pono way, whereas the U.S. used to do business with the kingdom, recognizing full well its independence. Whereas, on January 14th, 1893, the Minister of the United States helped Thurston and his cronies to overthrow the lawful government of Hawaii. Whereas, when informed that the American military had landed on Honolulu's shores in support of the overthrow, Queen Liliuokalani issued her yield to the United States of America, but only until the government of the United States shall, upon facts being presented to it, undo the action of its representatives and reinstate me in the authority which I claim as the constitutional sovereign of the Hawaiian lands. And right there, our eyes unglazed and our hearts snagged, the Queen's message front and center in their grand apology bill. Again and again, the line never got old, so technical, so precise, her wording was no accident. Within her final sentence, our case rested, yielded her authority to the United States in the trust that, given a history of diplomatic relations and a shared belief in a Christian God, its justice system would help her get her kingdom back. Yes, I, I just recently finished reading Hula and that, that was a very uh, um, powerful moment in your book. Thank you. Um, I think, both of you, uh, although born and raised in Hawaii, have spent a lot of time outside of Hawaii. Do you find that people not familiar with Hawaii are um, aware of some of those issues of, uh, of Hawaiian history? Or, or do you find yourself educating people a lot or letting it go? Or how does that work? Sarah, do you want to answer first? I'll let you answer first. <laughs> um, well, you know, because I've been doing these events, I, my book just came out that it, it's, it's kind of interesting to, to present it uh, or present myself as somebody who knows I, I wrote this book and, and in doing so, I, I wanted to put into context what my memories. And so I had to do a lot of research. And when I was educated in Hilo, 
I had one day where it actually wasn't even a full day of his uh, U.S. history in high school where we covered um, Hawaii. It was about a, a one sentence that said Hawaii became a state on, in this year. And that was all I knew um, formally about Hawaiian history. And so um, so it's it was I never assumed that anyone would really know a lot about Hawaiian history. And and as I travel, it's a very rare that anyone knows even that it was a kingdom. And Sarah, you talk a lot about World War II in your books. Uh, how uh, do you feel that it's necessary to give a lot of context or do you think people are still familiar with Pearl Harbor or how do you? Um, I think that people definitely know about Pearl Harbor. It seems like everybody knows about the attack on Pearl Harbor, but they don't know, like, there was so much more there was so much more on all the islands and, and the people of Hawaii and went on here, what went on here during the war after the attack on Pearl Harbor. You know, everybody knows about the battles, but so it's interesting to educate people. Uh, I feel like it's been good to shine a light on the other stories. And also um, it's been nice because I feel like everyone that, or people that reach out to me, they always, you know, they're like, okay, well, my grandfather, my father, my uncle, was in the Pacific during the war. And um, I had no idea like a, a lot of this stuff. And so, you know, that that makes me feel good that I'm I'm helping, um, I guess, educate people. And, and, it, and it's important to them, you know, to know their family's history as well. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to say to everyone who's here on Zoom, welcome. And um, I'm not trying to dominate the conversation. I. Uh, have a million questions I could ask and will ask if I get a chance, but everyone else is also welcome to ask questions if you want to uh, raise your hand on on the, not just, I might not see it, if you just literally raise your hand, but use the uh, hand raising function on Zoom or post a question in chat or unmute yourself. Uh, let, me, let me give other people a chance before I plunge into more questions. Would anyone like to ask something? Okay, everybody's a little bit shy, not me. <laughs> I enjoyed reading Hula and I also read Radar Girls and uh, I I felt so happy because, uh, you know, my job as executive director can be tedious at times, but here's like, oh my God, my job is reading now. What could be better? <laughs> so um, I guess I would ask both of you who you have in mind, if anyone, as um, your audience, because I think any author would probably love it if everyone in the world read their books, but um, given that people have different tastes in reading, that probably won't happen. So do you have a picture of who you would like to see or who you think will read your books? Start with you, Sarah. Um, you know, I did it. I didn't, when I set out to write them, it was almost more for myself. You know, I wrote three books before my first one got published, so I have a bunch of unpublished books. But um, the the what I've noticed is I think I definitely might I have an older audience, people that are a little bit more interested in World War II that may have a connection to it, um, not necessarily, um, and more women than men. But one thing that I I like and I would like for uh, or to see happen more is to have more men reading the books because I do get a lot of good feedback from men um, who enjoy them but I think my publisher definitely markets them as women's books you know the covers they always have women on the covers and the historical fiction trend is always to have the woman facing away from the you know from the camera and so um you know I just I whoever wants to read them I'm very happy uh the people from Hawaii people from the mainland um, any anybody that wants to read them, Jasmine? What about you? Have, do you have a an image in your mind of who's going to be reading Hula? Uh, well, when I wrote it, I, I very similar to Sarah. I wrote it for me. I you know, growing up, actually, my senior year in high school, I went to Waikea and I went to school in the morning, and then in the afternoons, I shelved books at the at the public library. And and by shelved books, I mean I would shelve everything as fast as I could. And then the less, the next, you know, hour and a half, I'd just read somewhere hiding from the librarians. 
And I was not a great uh, employee. I was a reader and I just read voraciously everything I could get my hands on and nothing I ever read reflected in any way the world that I lived in and, and the concerns and, you know, and, and the way we spoke and, and just cultural values. And so I think that just stuck with me. So when I wrote this, I wanted to, I wanted to hear it. I wanted to hear and see my world. And so part of me envisioned me in high school, picking this up and reading it. And then the other part of me, you know, um, I kind of had to set aside who I thought would read this or else I, I would just kind of, I think, be self-conscious. But it has been very um, kind of incredible. The book's only been out, what, five weeks now, something like that. And um, just hearing from people all over the country saying, you know, this is, I, we're, they're talking about blood quantums. And before, whenever I talk about blood quantum laws to people, not a single person ever knew what I was talking about, you know, and, and to have um, people say, thank you. I, I just came to Kauai and this changed the whole, my whole relationship with my, my trip here and, and stuff. And that's just been really rewarding. So I, I, I would love for more people to read it, but then also I just, I, I really wanted this to be an offering to my home and to Hilo. Well, I would imagine um, when you've, both of you have dealt with uh, agents and editors and your publisher, um, have you had to educate them at all? Or, or uh, has anybody said something like, oh, but no one's going to understand this about Hawaii or, or are they familiar with it? Or how has it been negotiating that process? Uh, well, I'll go first. Um, it's been interesting. Uh, you know, when you're dealing with people from New York and Canada or, you know, Toronto, my agent, I don't, my agent and editor had never been to Hawaii. Um, and they had, and then they had no, so they really had no idea um, about anything. And I think my first awareness of what I was dealing with was my cover of my book. So it's, set in Honoka and Waimea and um, there's some YPO Valley scenes. And so I sent them pictures. They ask you, you know, what do you, some ideas. And, um, and then they gave me my cover concept and it was Kalalau Valley on Kauai. Um, and I, I said, no, this is the wrong island. You know, we can't do this. And, and I went back and forth with them a lot and they're like, well, it's, it's Hawaii. It's fine. It's Hawaii. And I said, well, People are going to look at me. It's my name on it. But they went ahead anyway, and, and they put Kalalau on the cover. Um, and then this book, Red Sky Over Hawaii, it's at the volcano. And they put the Ko'olau Mountains on Oahu first. And I was just, I was like, no, no, no. So I got them to change that and put Mauna Loa, thank goodness. But, you know, you're dealing with people that are so far removed that um, it can be really challenging. And and also for um, narrators, I've had I've had a hard time with narrators, and um, just having to educate people. Um, and it, it's been a process, but it's getting better. And slowly over time, you know, they understand. I think they're getting to understand more. Can you elaborate that on that? What do you mean when you say you have trouble with narrators? The oh. narrators pronouncing the Hawaiian words. Yeah. Oh, I see. For yeah. Um, audio versions of the book. Yes, yes. Oh, I didn't even think of that aspect of it. <laughs> For my third and fifth book, I, I got a woman from Oahu and she's great. And so I'm going to just keep doing that. Yeah, for sure. And Jasmine, what about you? Have you had to educate the people you've been working with in the publishing in industry? This was a very, um, I got publishing 101, uh, the politics of it all through this, writing this. Um, there was so many specific things culturally that this book talk, talk, uh, you know, talks about and touches on that was so integral to, to my goals for what I was trying to say. And um, when it first, uh, my agent, Thankfully, you know, she and I met and she was a military brat and had spent time in Kauai. And so she said, when we met, she just said, 
you know, nothing that she'd ever read or seen ever reflected her experience there. So she, she's like, and I don't, I don't know all the details, but I just knew that it wasn't capturing what I had lived in. And so she became my very fierce supporter. And together we, we went through a lot of ups and downs. Uh, in my book got an interest um, from various um, publishing houses. And the um, original editor, um, the book got orphaned, which means that the original editor left my publishing house. And so the book went to a different editor in the house and it kind of passed through hands. And throughout that whole thing, none of the editors really kind of knew even what questions to ask. And I found that the challenge with this wasn't necessarily educating them. It was reminding them that a lot of people think they know Hawaii. They've been to Hawaii, they'll tell you their stories. And it was, it was um, that it wasn't a fictional kingdom somewhere where they were automatically code switching and assuming that you know what I'm saying is just the culture there. They would switch it. They would change it to something that they were more familiar with. And so, by the you know we ended up actually never really meeting, um, uh, finding a, a balance. And I moved to a different uh, publishing house, and the editor there and I had to really kind of sentence by sentence and go through it and say this is here for a reason, and this is here because this means this, and this means this, and she had to trust me a lot. And, and there were, you know, um, on the, in the margins where you make comments with the various editors and readers, I would just, at a certain point, I just started saying code switch, code switch, you know, just r reminding you that uh, you're not where you think you are, you know? And um, so, yeah, it, it was, I think people want more diverse books, but I think we're still learning how to, um, how to process that, the, the, how to edit those books and, and the questions to ask when you're, when you're discussing a place that you don't, you're not familiar with. You know. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. I, we do have a comment here, maybe not a question, but uh, the comment, thanks for speaking to the difficulties of editing, of editing by others of affecting an author's voice. Yes, that was, uh, that was quite illuminating to, to hear that. Um, and so, uh, Sarah, did you want to speak to that at all? I, I have to say, and I haven't read all of Sarah's books. I've read Hula, and I just finished um, reading Radar Girls. Um, I was impressed by how less is more, where not everything was explained, and it was left to the reader to code switch or whatever, or, or gain from context and understanding of what was going on. Um, have either of you ever felt tempted to explain 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 and not follow the maxim less is more have you <laughs> is that a temptation at all <laughs> um i think i usually go the other way i don't explain enough i am one of those people that underwrites so i always have to add um and i don't i don't want to you know i don't want to it's not like i just i'm trying to tell a story and so it's not like i want to give a like a lesson to people you know it's a story set in Hawaii about people you know it's it's about the characters are fictional the setting is real events are are sometimes real but you know at, I think at the at the crux of everything is, is just telling a story and so sometimes you do have to add in little bits of um you know history or, or just to clarify things but I think a lot of times the story can just kind of stand on its own. I have had people tell me um, they would like to, they wish there was a, like an index or a glossary and, you know, with what the meaning of Hawaiian words or, or that kind of thing. But um, yeah, for the most part, I, I just, I want to tell the story. Yeah. Jasmine, did anyone suggest to you that your book have a glossary? Because I felt oh. like someone who... <laughs> 
So um, come to the islands for about uh, about a quarter of a century and has lived here for about five years. I felt fairly comfortable with it, but I'm sure there would be, you know, um, continental readers who would not necessarily know all the words. Many, many a discussion. Yes, the team on every level. Yeah, I think the, the glossary debate lives on. Um, but for me, it was, it was actually, I never wanted to educate anyone. I, um, you know, I had, I, the book covers kind of the evolution of the sovereignty movement, as well as the uh, cultural renaissance that went on in Hilo 70s, 80s, and 90s. And so I had personal memories of these things. Um, and so when I'm writing this fictional family and, and what they're fighting about, I'm drawing from these memories. But because I was a kid and because, you know, I, I, I it was just kind of happening in the periphery of my life. I didn't really understand it. And, and so when I, everybody kept uh, at every stage of editing um, and kind of going through it to find that balance of telling a story and putting it into context, a historical context of why they have certain people have these opinions and why they have, they have these concerns. And we kind of had to build out. And even for myself, it was just, kind of like, okay, well, this is what they're discussing and this very complex problem. Um, and now I have to explain to you where that's coming from. And and so if I had told myself I was going to write a historical fiction about Hawaii, you know, I never would have embarked on it. I, I'm not a missioner. I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't try to be. Um, but I found myself having to kind of fill in the... Um, the political and social context for what this family was trying to work through and and the history of that and so it became a okay well here's it's there's going to be a history lesson here but i'm going to make that part of the story and so the narrator addresses the reader directly and says you don't know this and it's kind of a confrontational thing and i hear i'm going to tell you and even the fact that you don't know this is a political act it's a deliberate thing you know so i kind of had to present it in that way of, yes, forgive me, this is a history lesson, but there's a reason, trust me, I'm, uh, I will lead you somewhere. Well, yeah, the whole idea of Hawaiian sover sovereignty, that's a very political issue. But something I picked up um, from reading uh, both of your works was there's also, I don't know whether it's deliberate or if you feel like feminist authors, but definitely, of course, um, all of the main characters are are very strong women. And uh, maybe we learned a little bit about the roles that they played in different situations that uh, readers may not have known before. I'll, I'll start with Sarah. Um, do you feel like you would identify yourself as a feminist writer or, or not? Um, uh, that's a good question. I I wouldn't say I identify myself as a feminist writer, um, but I do love to tell women's stories. And I think I've been fortunate to be surrounded by, you know, my mom's mother, just some, and my mom, just very strong women. Um, and, you know, my, so during, during the war, my grandfather was the principal at Honoka and my grandma was a teacher there. So I grew up on all their stories of the wartime because they were there during the war. And um, I just, I got, there was so much going on there that is just never really talked about. You know, the, the books that I had read, like I said, there were the battles of Pearl Harbor and this and that. Um, but there were so many women um, that were kind of the backbone of everything, keeping everything functioning and um, and just, I, I wanted to tell that, I thought those are the kind of stories that I want to tell, you know, about women helping other women um, and women helping, you know, in, in Red Sky or Hawaii, she's helping her Japanese neighbor, her German, the German children whose parents were taken away. And, um, or in Radar Girls, the, the women that were in the air, women's air raid defense um, who were doing all the men's job because for the first time the men, um, where they were take they had to go away to war so the women were taking over so i just i think it's just you know these people i'm telling what they lived through and it happens to sound i guess like it's it's feminist strong women 
Jasmine, how about you? Would you embrace uh, that definition as a feminist writer or it's, that's just sort of incidental? How do you feel? Yeah, I, I, not deliberately. I mean, I, they say write what you know. My, I, you know, I, every woman in my family, in my community, I was raised by a lot of fierce women, you know, very smart. They improvised, they survived through war, through, you know, the feast and famine and, and all of the, you know, ups and downs of, of, of trying to kind of navigate life and and so I think you know just observing that and and the the role that all of these women played um to me there was no question that that was what even you know even in hula I I all of my uh role models everyone in my life that was uh somebody that kind of told me what to do and what not to do and all of those things they were all women <laughs> So, you know, I mean, I don't know if that's just Hawaii or Hilo, but it was, you know, I had um, a very lucky uh, childhood where I could go to my hula halau and these women were all just so intelligent and wanting to share their knowledge. And um, it, although it was interesting during through the book, you know, a lot of my early readers and editors would say, well, where are the men? <laughs> like, was that an accident? And I'd say no, you know, and they would try to draw the men into more of the foreground. And, and I resisted very much. Um, and it wasn't necessarily to be, be a feminist writer. It was more of a, we have plenty of books set in Hawaii that cover romance. That's not what this is. You know, uh, this is, I'm, I'm giving you something else here. And, and um, I, I didn't want to ignore men in this, but to me, the, I wanted deliberately to give you a story that was about mothers and daughters, and that that's not a, um, it's not a did she he get the you know girl type of uh, propelling force of of the narrator. <laughs> Well, I think uh, I suspect that writers, mostly male, but male or female, rarely get told. But but the book is all about men, you know. Exactly. <laughs> true. Oh. Very true. Well, it seems like uh, both of you have had a passion for writing um, from a young age. Can you each tell me how you got started on the path to writing? I know that you've um, both written other things besides novels, um, but have you, did you imagine yourself when you were a child as becoming a novel writer when you were an adult, or how, how did that all work out? Sarah? Okay, um, I was a reader also. My mom was a teacher, so I started reading young, but um, I love poetry. So I, um, when I was in college, I took a wonderful creative writing class at UH and the teacher, um, it was part fiction, part poetry. And after that class, every year, I would write poems throughout the year and then compile a poem book at the end of the year at Christmas time. And I would give those out to friends and family. Um, and they were mostly nature poems, just Hawaii, you know. And so that was um, that was really my start in writing. And I love to read, but I never, I never, um, until I was a little bit older, really thought that I could write a novel. And actually, when I started writing a novel, I had di still didn't think I could write a novel. Um, but I was I worked at Kahuku High School for a long time. I was a teacher and a counselor, and then. Um, my school and then I taught online and then it ha so happened that my school shut down and so suddenly I had time to write because I didn't I just never had felt like I had time to write um and so I sat down and I just started writing a book um and it very much seated my pants like I didn't plot it nothing um it was set in Koke'e on Kauai um and so that was my first novel and then I, I got the bug it just it, I loved it it was terrible, but but I still love the story, but the writing, you know, I just needed to to learn how to write, essentially, because poetry and novels obviously are very different. Uh, but I do think that poetry, being able to, you know, just capture the essence of things, I think that really helped me. Uh, and then I wrote a couple more books. And so it wasn't until 
my fourth book, like I said, that, that I got myself an agent. And I had a feeling, you know, when I, when I started this book, I kind of had the feeling like this is going to be the one that will actually get me an agent because it was World War II. My other books weren't World War II. And I think just that historical nature of it, uh, telling a story about Pearl Harbor that hadn't really been told before because it was set on the big island. Um, you know, because there was 50, there had been 50,000 Marines in, in Waimea and Honoka'a. And so I think that kind of just resonated with people. And, and yeah, the rest is history. I've just kept on writing ever since. Just a little bit of a pun there, given the nature of your books. Um, I, I, okay, I would, uh, we do have a, a question in the chat box, but first I will let Jasmine address the, uh, the question of how you evolved into a, a novel writer. I know you've also written uh, many other things besides uh, novels, but if you saw yourself becoming a fiction writer someday. No, I, I don't think I, I had the self-confidence um, to ever have aspired to that at all. It, you know, the, the authors to me were just, you know, this untouchable, they were larger than life. And um, I, I do remember, though, in fourth grade, finding out that there was such a thing as an editor. And, and I just went, okay, they just get to read and find mistakes in books. And I just thought, that's so I mean, wow, <laughs> you know, that's what I want to do. Um, how do I do that? And, um, but I found myself writing when I got older, um, there were a series of just chaotic things that happened in my, my childhood and my young adult life that, um, that just left me very ungrounded. And I found myself writing um, about, I started working on a memoir and it was not with a goal of getting published or even writing a memoir. I was almost very apologetic about that. That sounded very, you know, self-important at that time. Um, but I found that when I could write scenes about things that had happened to me um, that were very painful, I could process them. You know, if I could capture the words and and the the memories into sentences, I could just kind of digest it. To a certain extent and then I, that moved on to I again, like Sarah I wrote um, spent 10 years writing a, a novel uh, that probably will never see the light of day and finishing the memoir and um, and so by the time I sat down to write Hula it was very much a an exercise in um, I want I want to feel what it is or see what I would like to see on a page and and just enjoy the process of writing i had to get away from 10 years of trying to learn how to write and and very similarly in the experience where there was some suddenly an energy to it and i started shaking like oh this is different so i think even up until that point i hadn't said i i'm gonna get this published and i'm gonna be a writer i do remember though people you know my children because for years I, I was a single mom doing the, you know writing when they were sleeping in on saturdays but we would go to every bookstore and every library, you know, whenever we were traveling or something. And I would always stick my hand in between the books where my book would go. And it wasn't an active like manifestation of anything. It was just more of a like, that's where I'd go. And, and so I guess there was a part of me that, that was aspiring to that, but nothing that I, I would consciously acknowledge. <laughs> I like that story about putting your hand in where your book would go. Um, we do have a question in the chat box uh, for both of you. Um, I think this is a question a lot of people want to ask writers. I bet you've heard this before. How did you find your agent and connect to a publishing house? Good nuts and bolts question. Um, I guess we could start with you, Jasmine, since you're on screen, and then we'll move to Sarah. Sure. I, well, uh, you know, in the 10 years that I was writing that book, for, for me, it was just kind of like I had finished this manuscript. And so the next thing you do is send it out. It wasn't even a, I'm going to get published. It was a very weird, I was just kind of like one foot in front of the other. Um, like, that's just what you do when you finish a manuscript. And so in that process, I started talking to agents and started learning and people, and I got to the point where they would send me back comments and suggestions and for me, that was more of a process of like, I, I want to be a good, I want to be good at this. And all of these rejections are helping me learn and forcing me to be better. And um, 
So there's a very big conference once a year. It's called AWP, and a lot of writers go to it. And um, a writer, a successful writer friend that I have had said, well, it's in my hometown this next year. Why don't you go? And it was the first time where I was starting to treat myself. It was at the beginning of when I started treating myself as a serious writer and admitting it out loud that this is what I was. Um, and so I said, sure, you know, I'll, I'll for once put money and invest in going to this conference. There's a lot of panels and a lot of writers go to this. It's not one of those like meet agents. It's more writers talking about the business of writing. Um, but that year, it was 2019, 2018, something like that, not that long ago, that uh, the AWP, pro, they decided to institute a program where you could submit a, a query letter, which is basically how you introduce yourself and your project to agents, um, but you wouldn't direct it to any agent in particular. Agents and publishing houses, they go to these the, this conference primarily to see the the authors that they already have, you know, so it's not necessarily a meet your agent type of event, but since they're there, AWP said, we're going to do this program. You can just give us a, a blind query letter, a generic query letter, and agents who are coming to the conference anyway, will look through them. And if they're interested, they'll ask, they'll reach out to you. And I just went, well, I don't have anything to lose. I had just finished writing Hula and I knew it was rough. It didn't it wasn't ready to be you know, submitted anywhere. It wasn't polished at all, but I just thought, well, I'm going to this thing anyway. And so I submitted a query letter, three agents contacted me and had read the whole manuscript by the time the conference came about, which was very valuable because I thought, even if they reject me, I get to sit in a room with them and hear why, you know, with an email, when they say, no, you can't say like, but why? And this was like, I want to hear from them, you know, and, and to hear what they have to say. And that'll, it'll be a learning experience. And the subjectivity of, of, of you know, editors and, and agents is, um, is kind of infamous, but the first agent was very interested you know, had all these suggestions. And if you do all these things, come back to me. You have something here, but it's not ready, which I totally appreciated. Second agent said, love what you have here, but maybe you should learn how to write. I mean, she said it nicer, than that, but basically it was learn how to write and then rewrite it and then come back to me because I like this, but you got to do something better. Um, and then the third agent where I, by then I was like ready to go home and cry. Um, the third agent, she, she just said, I let, we're going to do this. I want this. We're, I'm ready to sign you. We're going to do this. I love this. And, and to meet somebody, it's very much like dating. It's a, it's a, we shared a common goal and a vision. And she was so enthusiastic about it that while we were in the process of editing and getting it ready to submit to publishing houses, she was going back and forth from LA to New York and talking to all the editors she already knew and said, you're going to want this. And that was why by the four months into editing with her, when we finally were ready to submit it, there were multiple houses that because I had a very reputable agent who had been building up the hype were interested in it. And, and then having that opportunity to meet with the different editors and who would, it was more like a kind of an interview of are we, you know, do we share in the same goal of where we want to go with this and the marketing and, and the specificity of it all? And so it was a, it, I think it was an unusual process. I know a lot of authors that have never met their agents in person, but um, I, this one really took a, took a village. So it's, it's kind of found its way to the right people, I think. Yeah, that's interesting. You you talk about the the difference in response from different agents. I was uh, chatting online with a writer the other day who said, you know, that they got lots of feedback, but it was sometimes hard to choose because they'd get exactly the opposite feedback from different people. So you kind of have to decide who are you going to listen to. Um, Sarah, how about you? How did you connect with an agent? Uh, well, let me just say that was interesting, Jasmine, to hear your story. You know, because that is that is um you know a lot of people's dreams to just meet an agent at a conference and um connect like that so congratulations Thank on you. that super exciting um i kind of mine is kind of just the traditional way i did go to santa barbara writers 
conference and um, the, I think at the time I went to Kauai, I already had an agent, but I, I kept submitting query letters for my first three books that I had written. And, you know, people had told me, people started telling me, well, why don't you just self-publish? Why don't you just self-publish? And, and for me, everyone has different goals, but for me, like Jasmine said, like I wanted to be able to write up well enough that I could get a traditional publishing deal. So I was gonna wait until however long it took um, to get an agent and a, a book deal. Um, I, I, some people, you know, self-publishing, it works great. But so I did uh, on my fourth book, I was submitting and I was still not getting, I was getting some, you know, feedback and comments, but no offers. So then I went and hired a an editor who a friend recommended. She's she's an editor also on the mainland, and this editor was wonderful. We did a full developmental edit, you know, plot, character, and all of that. And after she finished it, um, I started submitting again, and then um, I got an offer from my agent. And well, it was actually her boss that sent me the email. I, I was ready to give up. I had, you know, I had done pitch wars and I was like the runner up, but I didn't know that at that point. And I didn't get accepted. And I was just like, oh my gosh, I'm ready to give up. And then I got a, a an email saying they had, they had been reading it to each other in the office. And they loved it. And so the head of the agency didn't take it on because she was too busy, but her, um, her co-agent did. And so yeah, it was very, very exciting. I will tell you that much after years and years of getting rejections. Yeah, seems like that's a process that all writers have to, to go through is getting a lot of rejections first. But if you're really meant to be a writer, you will keep trying. Well, I will say that the the yes is actually the like you brace yourself for the no. But after years of no, when that agent, my, that third agent said, you know, I want to sign you. I just kind of sat there because I was waiting for the but. I was waiting for the like, I want to sign you, but after you do X, Y, Z. And so I just kind of sat there and there was a few minutes that passed. And she said, well, so do you want to think about it? And I went, oh, you're serious. And she's like, yeah, right now. And I was like, hold on. And I, so I went, I left the room. And then I came back and I was like, okay, this is actually really happening. So we were hugging and everything because, you know, you you hear about how hard it is and it's, it's incredibly hard. And, you know, and so it was actually the yes that I had to, that was jarring. <laughs> oh, we have another question in the, uh, the chat box, uh, which I know I'm going to enjoy the answers to because I know from having looked at your websites, I have a clue as to what each of you are going to say. Um, but the question is, do you each have multiple book ideas that you want to work on going forward? And Jasmine, I think maybe you're working on a memoir or it's nearly done? I, I have the memoir, um, you know, it's, it's, I, I found that in my life, I had a uh, certain, um, I guess, fixations on belonging and identity and where, where cultural inheritance kind of intersects with personal identity. And, and so the memoir is basically my relationship. It covers my relationship with Hawaii and uh, living in Eastern Europe and ex-Yugoslavia and finding certain parallels there and some interesting things. But uh, my house wants a novel first, and I have the I have a few uh, notes that I have to kind of piece together in order to to give them some pages soon. But um, it turns out to be another kind of touching on history, which I I think I'm boxing myself in, and I it's I'm the act I you know in in the in hula I call certain people um, accidental activists, and so I've become like the accidental historian. <laughs> I <laughs> didn't mean to do that. Well, it's funny because I did not set out to write historical fiction either at all. My first, at all. And it's just so interesting. Now I have five and more on the way. It's funny how it works out. Yes, in the, your sixth book, uh, in speaking of I, ideas going forward, um, am I correct in that your next book is about a female aviator? It is. It is. I'm editing that right now. Um, it's about the Dole Air Race, which happened in 1927. It was um, right after Charles Lindbergh crossed the Atlantic. There was a race to Hawaii. 
Um, and so it's a fictionalized version of the book, but it's a, it's a, when I first read this story, I, I had never heard of it. And I thought, I, you know, whenever I read cer certain things, it's instant. I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to write a book about this. Um, and so I did. And it is coming out in, uh, I think, February of 2024. So, and then I have another historical one after that, that I've already written a synopsis for. It's set in 1905 in Waikiki. And then um, I have a couple other ideas too, so. I, I, I mean, don't you find, Sarah, I'm, I think the thing that's fascinating about historical fiction is there's so much history that hasn't been written. So when you happen upon like a little, a little nugget of a half story, an anecdote basically about something, it's like with fiction, you can connect dots that you just can't otherwise. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I mean, and so I've kind of falling in love with just that aspect of it, you know. It is. Yeah. When you find like a little thing like this, it was in a book someone gave me. It was, I think, the Saga of the Sandwich Isles, like it's Islands. It's an old book. And it just has all these little just historical nuggets. And I looked through the whole thing and I came upon this and I was just blown away by this story. It's very sad. It's a tragic story. Um, but it's and there were no female actual pilots in the race. There was a woman in the race, but um, I have, it's fiction. So I have a woman in the race as, oh, she's a pilot, but you'll have to read it to find out actually what happens. Sounds yeah, great. My next one, sorry, I'm interrupting you because I'm now I'm getting excited about the, all this. My next one, I found out similarly, um, I lived in Sacramento for many years and uh, Sacramento was um, kind of started by John Sutter. And so there's Sutter's Fort and that's where, you know, first found gold and all of these things. Well, if you go to Sutter's Fort uh, and in his diaries, he talks about Sutter's Hawaiians. He had 10 Hawaiians that are basically unnamed and, um, and he credits them for everything, taught them how to make thatched hut, you know, roof, roofs for their huts and taught them how to um, catch salmon and basically negotiated his, his survival um, with the, the natives that were in the area at that time, it was kind of ungovernable land. And that was the only reason he could get a land grant was because his Hawaiian, his Hawaiians were um, kind of his emissaries in, in the area. And I just, it's fascinating to me what an important role, and there's evidence that they were the first ones to find, to start the gold rush, to find gold, and nothing else is written about these, and so, I, of course, that's my next, you know, I'm just kind of like, well, I'm gonna, okay, one last historical novel, and then, and then I'll move on, but, yeah. I mean, it, no one, you know, when I spoke to Sutter's archivist, they said, please write this, you know, every day we give these tours, and that's all we say, we, there's no even names, so even a fictional account of this would give some acknowledgement of mm -hmm. contribution to history, or at least that's kind of where, where I'm going with it. Wow. Sounds fascinating. Yeah. Sounds like a, um, a fun challenge to write something that's historical, but maybe there's not a lot of uh, factual information out there. I guess that gives you the freedom. I'll well, just casually rewrite the gold rush history. Yeah. <laughs> Although, you know, going through the foothills of Northern California it, to do research because there aren't a lot of archived, you know, the things that were written down, especially anyone Brown was just, you know, they were just working there and there were, it, it, they were counted as numbers basically. But you go through the foothills and you'll find Kanaka Village. And I found in a little town called Bur Murphy's, there was a Queen Liliokalani Boulevard. I mean, oh so, God. you know, w once you start looking for it, it's there, it's, which has been pretty incredible. Yeah, that's cool. Ah, uh, we have another question in the chat box. Can you shamelessly mention any events you have coming up? Uh, Jasmine, Kona Stories, and basically books. Sarah, please let me know when you will be on island again so we can set something up. <laughs> Sarah and I are turning into the dynamic duo. We, I'm, let me pull up my, <laughs> because we actually do have an event. I, what was it? Um, I think it's July 16th, maybe at Kona Stories. 
July or, well, actually, I'll be at basically Books and Hilo on the 16th. I think that's the 15th. Okay. Yeah, in July. And I'm going my, so that's Hawaii. I'm going to the East Coast this week. I'll be in Connecticut and Boston, different kind of history uh, there uh, to do events there. And then I'll be coming back to, to Hawaii to, uh, I think basically books is going to be um, uh, on the, the 16th. The Sunday, I believe. And Christine, I'm happy to come to Hilo anytime as well to just talk stories, sign books, anything. Um, now that I'm back on island full time. Okay. Yeah, and I, I will take this opportunity to give a shout out to um, Brenda McConnell, who's not with us today, but uh, from from Kona Stories, who. Uh, who is responsible for for uh, getting both Sarah and Jasmine to to um, do this event with EHCC? So thank you, Brenda, if you're out there and you watch this on Zoom later. Uh, any more questions from uh, from the audience? I think the, the, we're almost uh, up on an hour, so I'm going to bring this to a close fairly quickly. So if you've got a question, now's the time to ask. Uh, I will ask one more question um, myself, which is, you know, of course, as I, I'm sure both our authors know all too well, uh, the book business has a lot to do with uh, economics and marketing and not just the quality or interesting uh, material that you want to write about it. So I have a, a scenario for both of you to think about, which is what if your publisher came to you and said, oh, gosh, we just love your books. We think we could sell so many more new books by you. But, you know, we've done some market research and Hawaii's kind of, you know, everybody's a little tired of Hawaii. Could you just write a, a novel that was not based in Hawaii? How would you react to that? Sarah, you wanna... Why don't you go first, Jasmine? I, you know, I think I, my goal isn't really kind of to focus on, this is my debut, so I haven't really gotten that far to say what all my books are going to be about in the future. Um, the next one certainly is going to be, but um, if that ever happened, I, you know, Hula was, Hawaii was a character. It was a main character in the book. And I don't think uh, if if I if it wasn't a main character, I wouldn't mind setting it somewhere else. I just the way I write, I think I would have to be familiar with that place, you know. But I certainly um, a story is a story unless unless it's place based, which this one hap just happens to be, you know. Yeah, you know, I um, same here. Like Hawaii in my books, I feel like is a character as well. It's just, and it's something I know so well that it's stuff that, it's one part of the book that I'm not having to really research or look up is the setting. Um, and so far, well, I, so the book I just finished writing it, there was some in San Diego, some in Oakland. Um, and then I've also just written a contemporary novel that I'm not sure I'm supposed to really talk about yet, but parts of that are set in Portugal, California in Mexico. So it was hard for me to write. It was a lot harder for, for me to write those um, without having, I've been to, you know, some of these places in California. I've been to Mexico, I've been to Portugal, but not these specific places. So um, I would, you know, one of, one of the, my author friends recently said, in order to survive in this business, you have to be able to pivot. And I agree, I agree with that. Um, and if, if they said you have to write about somewhere else in order to keep writing, then I probably would. Uh, you know, there's so many other wonderful places in the world that I've been. And I could maybe, maybe I'd go to British Columbia and spend some time there and write a novel set there. Um, it would remain to be seen. Okay. Well, I'm glad that it, it sounds like we'll be able to um, do a lot of great reading in the future from both of you. Uh, I think I'll wrap this up now, but uh, I did put something in the chat box. There's a link 
to a survey. Um, the East White Cultural Center is a nonprofit, and we're always looking for grants. And when we get feedback from people who attend events like this, it's really helpful to us either to improve what we do or to tell possible grantors, hey, look how much everybody loved this. So whether your comments or po are, are positive or negative, they will help us very much. So I thank our audience for anybody who clicks on that link. And of course, I want to give a huge thank you to both Sarah and Jasmine for doing this for us. It was very illuminating. And honestly, as somebody who ran the second half of our lecture series this year, it was hands down my favorite. So thank you both so much. Well, thank you for doing this. This is this is great. Yes, it's wonderful. And I this is I read Jasmine's book early on and I just loved it and I've been raving about it to everybody. And um so this is the first time I'm actually getting to meet her. So it was fun too. Yes, very nice. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, this has been amazing. Okay. Awesome. Right. Thank oh, you. I see, wait, I see one thing down below a comment is please consider recording your books for Audible. Um they well, they are on Audible, but did, she, did the person, I mean, is the question, should do they want us to record them? Or I wasn't sure what that question was. That was a question from Linda. Linda, if you want to um, either unmute yourself and talk or put something in the chat box. Hi, I'll talk. Um, I wasn't aware that, that they were on Audible. Is Hula on Audible as well? It is. And actually the feedback that I've gotten, we did do auditions and because it's written in Pigeon and it's so specific that we were very careful to go with somebody who knew it, who could execute it. And from what I've heard, it adds to the experience, especially for people that aren't necessarily familiar with Pigeon, that she just did an incredible job bringing it to life. So yes, it's on Audible. Oh, fabulous. Well, I in, really enjoy Audible and I will find both of your books there now that I know they're there. Yeah, thank they you. Are. Thank you. Okay, very good. It, it's hard to hit the end meeting button after such a chat, but all good things. So I'm going to say thank you one more time and bye to everyone. <laughs>